So Declan, if you had to summarize, what is it about libertarians that you find so distasteful? Well, I, I don't know that I'd say distasteful. Um, many of them, I'm sure, are good people, uh, but they're wrong. Um, and the, the general problem with libertarianism is the same problem that we find with uh, establishment conservatism, that they mistake means for ends. And liberty, which is, um, some people would call it an, an intermediate end, I think it's simpler to just speak of it as a means to an end. Um, it's, it's the way we, we live as people, um, and it's the way we achieve ends and achieve uh, the, our intended purpose as you know, rational creatures made in the image and likeness of God, um, but it's not an end in and of itself. And if you build a worldview around the mistaken assumption that it is an end in and of itself, um, sooner or later, that's going to lead you to to ruin. Um, so there is this sort of distinction in practice between paleo libertarians and the sort of libertarian ink that we have right now. Um, and even you know paleo libertarians still exist. I'd say you know Rand Paul and Thomas Massey are basically sure. paleo libertarians, um, and those are people who we can work with in practice. Um, but the ideology itself sort of inevitably leads to this libertarian ink manifestation. Yeah, and, and I think you, you see that a lot in, in town, particularly in the yeah. libertarian movement, that the only thing that we are achieving is always the liberation of this or that. Liberty is the end. I mean, it's a good point. Yeah, and I think, I mean, this is something we've talked about before. There is a important distinction between the sort of libertarianism of the Cato Institute, which I think we're both very critical of, and a kind of folk libertarianism. I mean, the, the, the labels don't matter so much, right? But the, the ones that are um, not as sort of friendly to big business uh, and, you know, are, are much more amenable to the kind of conservatism that I think a lot of conservatives today are, um, are attracted to. So overall, I think the critique of libertarianism beyond the important philosophical differences is just that it is not capable of preventing what I see as an existential threat from the left from happening, and we need a more muscular kind of conservatism. Well, I think that puts us off to the races on the premise of this episode. So real quick, I just want to welcome everyone watching. This is Right Now. I'm your host, Stephen Kent. Here at the table, I've got Nate Hotchman, conservative columnist and fellow with the National Review, and taking a break from trolling libertarians on Clubhouse, Declan Leary, associate editor for the American Conservative Magazine. If you're new here, on this show, we are dedicated every week to cover covering the past, present, and future of the American right. And the goal is to help you better understand the divides and the debates that characterize both the Republican Party of today and what we've always kind of considered or understood as the conservative movement, like strong air quotes there. Today's epi episode is an important one for getting down that road. We would love if you would join us more regularly by hitting that like button and subscribe to the channel. We have new episodes every Thursday and original content in the days between. So do join us. So let's kind of continue here with, with libertarianism a little bit because we spend a lot of time on this show. Like I'm a libertarian myself or I consider myself an aspiring libertarian, meaning I have conservative sensibilities and kind of reactionary impulses to a lot of things, but I strive to be more libertarian day to day and just let things go. But you wrote a, an interesting piece that talked about the an old article like the twisted tree of liberty, right? And it's this idea that Basically, if you are just pursuing liberty as the end goal, that eventually you tie yourself into knots where you are less free as a result of whatever you think that you have unshackled yourself from. Like, I take that to be an important point because a lot of the ways in which we free ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives, we end up then marrying ourselves to a different kind of master. And we find ourselves still in sort of a cycle of being subservient to something. At the end of the day, it becomes your id, like your passions, right? What is the importance, do you think, of that argument and understanding this rift that has long been in the conservative movement between libertarians and their more conservative brethren? I, I think uh, it's very important, first and foremost, to understand, like you said, that this is nothing new. Um, the entire debate that's going on within the, the conservative movement right now, the sort of breakup of fusionism, the, the death of the old consensus, to borrow a, a phrase that's been used a few times, in the past couple years um, is really just what we might call Brent Bozell's revenge. Um, it's the result 
of the failure of the institutional conservative movement and of mainstream conservatism to adequately answer the concerns that Bozell presented more than half a century ago. Well, Fr Frank Meyer wrote The Twisted okay. Tree of Liberty, and Brent Bozell's um, famous essay, Freedom or Virtue, was a response to The okay. Twisted Tree of Liberty. Um, you know, the title is a bit counterintuitive, but The Twisted Tree of Liberty is actually a, a libertarian uh, essay. Okay. But to be clear, I mean, and this is probably a distinction between the kind of conservatism that I'm interested in and the kind of conservatism that Declan is interested in, is, you know, Bozell wasn't the only mer person making these critiques of this defect in the conservative movement. Um, there are a lot of different versions of it, and I'm, I'm not a Bozellite, because uh, Bozell, I mean, famously for people who follow, eventually renounced America itself and the founding um, as two. Well, those are two very different things. Sure, he re to, to, be to, be, to be fair, he renounced the founding, um, which I think is a departure from what most of the conservative mainstream has always seen itself as defending. I'm still a defender of the founding. I think political liberty, as it was conceived by the founders, is crucially important um, and is actually a precondition for virtue in important ways, even though I'm not a, a fusionist. Um, but the, the Bozell was a very radical, specific Catholic critique of these things, and not everyone who is critical of fusionism is someone who is ideologically aligned with Bozell. Jacqueline, could you respond to that and give sort of your opening definition of what the fusionism idea really is? I think you can get it from different places, but for people who are maybe never hearing this term before, they just sort of think of conservatives and Republicans as, you know, all sort of one thing. What is fusionism? Where is it going? Right. <laughs> Why is it going away? <laughs> so going back to, to the very beginning of the, the fusionist moment, sort of at the founding of National Review, um, and even a little before that, in the sort of defining years of the post-war conservative movement, there's always been disagreement uh, over what it actually is. And basically, the two schools of thought are that it's descriptive, um, that Frank Meyer is just saying, going back to Edmund Burke, um, liberty and traditionalism have gone hand in hand, and this is what conservatism is. And the other school says that it's normative. Uh, and that this is basically a pact made by Bill Buckley to defeat the communists um, and the libertarians and the traditionalists are going to come together and build a new party and kick out liberals like Eisenhower and make Barry Goldwater the, the uh, god king of the libertarian empire. Um, well, Eisenhower was a communist. I mean, if you if you follow the, the John and Bill Buckley is a CIA yeah. operative, apparently. Sorry. Right? Is Which that is, true? This I read is true. that in one I of mean, your pieces. Yes, he's a. Uh, he, never he's written books before. about about his uh, or had written books. He's dead, obviously, but he wrote books about his experience as as a CIA operative. He was pretty yeah. proud of it. Um, but you know, there's a little gray area about when he stopped being a CIA operative and about uh, <laughs> you know what things did he do that were CIA ops and what things did he do that were not CIA ops. I don't have the answers. I guess one of my questions here that that you've put in here is like that there are a strand of conservatives who view the American founding with skepticism. And outsiders to being on the right, I think, would look at that and be like, what are you talking about? Like, I think someone who is on the left politically or even like center left, they just sort of all think that we're like Tea Partyites. And they, they view people on picket lines in 2000, what was it, 12 or 2008 and 10, right? 10, yeah. uh, the Tea Party movement. They just like think that all people on the right are sort of rabid constitutionalists. That's not really the case. And I think one of the things that I noticed, particularly and have come to accept after Jan 6, not to like overblow what happened that day, but like there are a lot of people out there who don't just accept the state of the Democratic Republic of the United States that we have, the way that it is structured, and view it as working at all. There are a lot of conservatives who think that from the beginning there were mistakes made. What were the mistakes in your mind? Because I've, I've heard you a couple of times mention that the founding missed something important in restraining um, maybe our, our impulses, right, to try to get things right as people and be virtuous. Well, I'd, I'd say right off the bat, I don't reject the founding. Um, but I think we need to understand it in its proper place. It's a, a particular historical event. Um, you know, the founding documents were written by, by mortal men, um, flawed men, in a particular place, in a particular time, in particular circumstances. Um, and I think actually that they're fairly adequate insofar as they go, those documents, um, as of course, you know, a, a counterweight uh, or a revolt against the usurpation of executive authority by the English parliament um, following the Dutch invasion of 1688. 
Um, but we're certainly dealing with the consequences of 1688 today and of 1776, but we are not living in 1688 or 1776 today. And, and by the way, what Declan's saying is not a new conservative line on the founding because, I mean, within the conservative intellectual sphere, mm -hmm. yes, now you have a resurgent kind of Brent Bozellite Catholic integralist right, which just, I think it's fair to say, rejects the founding outright. Um, but there have always been different strains of con you know, of, of camps within the conservative intellectual movement that A, have just disagreed about what the founding meant, right? We're not unified in our understanding of what the founding is. And B, have argued that there are aspects of the founding which caused defects in the American spirit that we have to constantly watch for. And I think this is the division between, um, you know, like the East Coast Straussians and the West Coast Straussians. The East Coast Straussians see the sort of Jeffersonian strain of American thought as um, leading to progressivism. And the West Coast Straussians see progressivism as a departure from the founding. So, Can you unpack that a little bit sure. for me? So what is it about uh, Thomas Jefferson's legacy that has led us down the road that you're talking about? Well, it's about? not just Jefferson, but it's the sort of more radical strains of Enlightenment thought that, say, produced at their most extreme, you know, the Jacobins and the French Revolution, right? Uh, a, a, an antipathy towards religion, towards tradition, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a unnecessary or excessive attachment to politics as the pursuit of abstract principles, right? These things, there is disagreement amongst conserv all conservatives, or most conservatives are skeptical to a certain extent of those things, but there's disagreement, and there always has been disagreement within conservatism about just how present those things are in the founding and how much the founders themselves were proponents of them. Whether or not the government was supposed to actually do anything. Like, I think the one of the things that comes up in this debate a lot is the issue of value neutrality. Whether or not government can be neutral in any sort of sense when it is, I don't know, when it is like stepping out of a certain realm. Like, is government supposed to have an opinion on whether or not people should stay married or it should be harder to get divorced, right? Like, there's sort of the, the onset of no-fault divorce that happened in the 60s and 70s completely reshaped society and it was sort of done through the judiciary through circuit courts is just like well you know it should be even easier for people to absolve contracts but your viewpoint has always been like just because you liberate something doesn't mean that you don't then sort of enslave us to another thing which i think like in the case of no-fault divorce we've become enslaved to other sorts of problems uh, rather than just not being able to like get out of marriages as quick right yeah i mean so there's two things there. There's the general principle that neutrality is a myth. Um, and this is obviously true. When, when you make law, when you conduct politics, you are making a statement on what kind of society you want to build, what kind of society you want to create and live in. That can never be a neutral statement. There's always a value claim inherent in it. You're always legislating morality. Um, and the difference is you, between the two camps of the conservative movement right now is do we legislate in absolute individualism where we place the individual conscience over any outside authority? Or do we legislate a shared vision of substantive morality um, where we acknowledge uh, ends and goods as things to be achieved through law um, rather than left to uh, the, the chaos of 350 million individual actors? And, and by the way, being you know, cognizant of the fact that all laws are based on moral claims is not the same thing as necessarily being in favor of authoritarianism in any specific context. I mean, there is a moral case for limited government, but limited government itself as a principle is incoherent without being based on moral claims. And the problem with a, a specific section, uh, and I think a, a decent amount of the mainstream of the conservative movement, at least for the last few decades, is that we have become so scared of moral claims in politics because they're associated with the things that the left wants to do that we have become attached to this sort of fantastical idea of neutrality where we hate the idea of making moral claims for our arguments. But that's incoherent and it leads to an incoherent politics and a politics that ultimately is insufficient uh, you know, insufficiently able to preserve the things that we love about America, which is the issue I think we're facing now. I think I'm glad you brought up the issue of authoritarianism because you know critics of Catholic integralism, right? When you actually believe that the the state should draw from faith and it should draw from a higher place and be informed by something, we'll say that that leads to authoritarian impulses. I think you could argue going back throughout America's time existing, there have been times where the government was more authoritarian than not and expressed sort of value judgments. Do do 
you think it is a accurate characterization that you would like to see the government use more authority over the way people live their live their lives. Um, and does that make you an authoritarian? So in, in the abstract, yes. Um, I would not like this government exercising more authority over my life. Um, Isn't that the problem? Like, because it's always changing every four years. Like, it just never stops. Well, it's it's actually staffed, I think. I mean, one of the problems that uh, conservatives of all stripes uh, are, take issue with is that the government is actually run by people who don't change uh, from administration to administration. They're permanent, entrenched bureaucrats. I mean, I think... Uh, you know, at the height of the Trump administration, almost half of the people in the executive branch were still registered Democrats. So the, the problem is, to a certain extent, it is the people. Now, there is an insight in the fact that, you know, if you expand government, you know, eventually those new government powers will probably be run by people who disagree with you. But it's also true that our government is not being conducted the way that it's supposed to, and it is staffed by people who um, are the wrong people for any, any number of reasons. And a, and a large part of the conservative project has to be cognizant of that, rather than just kind of recoiling at the idea of ever using the government, understanding that there is a difference between, you know, uh, you know, sort of credentialed bureaucrats ruling over our lives and people who actually have an understanding of the principles of, of, of the American founding. Right. I mean, the, the simple answer is we want a government that can legislate for the good that can legislate a substantive vision of morality and make life better for ordinary Americans and create a social order that points the people under this government towards their ultimate end. Um, but we can't just act on that desire immediately. We have to create the governmental landscape and the political landscape in which we can actually have a hope of achieving that end. Um, so there's hard work to be done to you know, address these these institutional problems uh, before we can actually, uh, you know, uh, achieve the the integralist society that certain people, maybe me, uh, would like to see come about. I mean, it, it does seem, though, like you kind of are wishing for a thing which is not going to happen. Like, we're just a rapidly secularizing society. I happen to think that it's a bad thing, and I don't like it but it is what's happening. So how do you actually reform the society and drag people back forcibly towards what you would like to see with an acknowledgement, like you said, like I don't want this administration to do it, but this is co what's constantly happening. The way that this system, this country is set up is, is not workable to the kind of vision that I think you have, or am I wrong? Right, I mean, a lot of it, I think on the fundamental level, gets down to the, the material uh, world in which we live. Um, it's a question of political economy in a lot of ways. Um, people are not able to live the kind of lives that are going to, ena to enable them to pursue ultimate ends. Um, so I think the most concrete and achievable way under this current government that we can move towards a, a more humane um, and a more properly ordered uh, political order is by simply using the government to create um, the material environment in which people can live productive, meaningful, and independent lives. Um, because only in those circumstances are people free to uh, turn their attention to higher goods. And, and by the way, you know, Declan and I almost certainly agree on a lot of the specifics of that principle, but the, the abstract principle itself is completely, uh, would, would be completely recognizable to the founders and to most conservatives and people who care about liberty for most of American history. I mean, the idea of the role of government, I mean, the ultimate end of government is justice, according to Alexander Hamilton, but the, the role of government in achieving that end, which is justice, is securing the blessings of liberty. Uh, and, you know, for most of our history, we've understood that that means securing the preconditions for human flourishing. Uh, so, you know, conservatives have to understand that principle and embrace it, even when we quibble over the very important details of how you put that into action. But the idea that it is not the government's role to secure the preconditions for human flourishing is, again, not only absurd, but is a complete break with the American tradition properly constituted. You're talking about like living happy and productive lives, right? 
that's completely unobjectionable. I can't imagine anybody would go, I don't want people to be happy. In uh, virtuous lives. Or unproductive. And so, and so virtue, I think, is one of the big areas where we stumble, stumble across this and we don't know what to do or what we're really talking about. So like, just for example, um, I wrote in my, in my book, which comes out in November, um, something that is probably not actually true. I wrote that there are not a lot of conservatives losing sleep uh, at night over Obergefell, uh, right, and the gay marriage ruling. Um, you know, reading some of your work, I get the sense that that is not the case, and there are plenty of people who are losing sleep over that, and what has sort of happened since. Like, let's talk about sort of gender, let's talk about the world after Obergefell. Um, a lot has changed as the result of that ruling, which to me... I, I favor that ruling. I think it's a, a somewhat like good and neutral thing to do to actually give people the ability to form families rather than just sort of live in the wilderness of, uh, of being single and just dating. Like I don't think that that's good. But then there's the issue of adoption and forming families. And I read your piece on Pete Buttigieg's uh, adoption of two children, yes. right? Two children with his husband. Um, and I guess I just want to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that and frame your view of virtue as it relates to that issue. And then we can kind of unpack it a little bit towards the issue of kind of gender neutrality as well. Right. Um, so the, the problem uh, at the heart of Obergefell, the problem at the heart of this entire discussion is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the family is. We've come to view the family after the sexual revolution as a vehicle for personal fulfillment. You get married because you want to be happy, you have kids because you want to be happy, or you get a dog if that's easier and it'll still make you happy, and then once the dog stops making you happy, you have a kid so that you can be happy. Um, but that's not what the family is, and it's not what we've understood the family to be for the vast majority of human civilization. Um, family is about responsibility. Uh, it's the duty of the parents to the children, of the husband to the wife and the wife to the husband, and of all of them in relation to the society at large. Um, it's not about serving yourself. Family is fundamentally about serving others, first those within the family and then those beyond it. Um, so when we change the moral vocabulary in which we're talking about this issue, when we say that it's about happiness, it's about fulfillment and choice and liberty and freedom, rather than duty and responsibility and virtue properly understood. Um, the entire framework, because the family is, as we've understood for the vast majority of human civilization, the fundamental building block of society, not the individual, the family. I didn't hear anything in there about God, though. I mean, because what you just laid out, and I don't want to mischaracterize it and be hyperbolic, but what you were talking about, about building a family and then sort of like having it be oriented towards like building the society, like service to the people. And that sounds like Marxist ideas. Like that sounds like some sort of I Soviet. I, I, don't, Soviet I, don't, I don't, I think, No, I mean, I mean like that sounds like the kind of thing like China or the Soviet Union would have propagated. Well, I mean, so this, this is the Thomas problem. Aquinas, you know, too, and you know, most. The, you know, this is the problem I think with the debate right now is that libertarians hear talk of, uh -huh. of public goods. They hear talk of your duty to anything beyond yourself and they scream communism. Um, this is how conservatives have talked for most of the history of the conservative movement. It's how Christians have talked for most of the history of Christianity. I think the idea that like talking that way is is Marxist uh, right. is no, actually just, isn't indicative it, of the it problem. It smacks of it. I mean, what I view the family of is is honoring God. Right? You are living out what God has called us to do, which is procreate, fill the earth, right. um, and and take care of one another. That's a, a ham-handed way of saying it. But like, what I didn't hear in any of that answer was like the higher calling. All I heard about was was society and building our civilization. I mean, this all absolutely points back towards God, um, but it exists in the physical world. Um, it is a natural thing. Um, and the natural law, of course, of course, points us towards God, and it comes from God. Um, but, you know, if we're going to have this conversation within a secular framework, um, these arguments can all be made without immediately going back to, to the religious justification, um, because even if we don't point back towards the ultimate creator explicitly, um, we can see the good of the creation manifest in itself. The other, so, the, I mean, the, the reference to God I, I see as implicit in the understanding of natural law, not as absent. The other thing is, I mean, what Declan is saying about responsibility is true, uh, but the point about happiness, I think, the, the correct defense of what we're talking about is that true happiness, the highest form of happiness, is only possible when you exist against the backdrop 
of this web of intersecting rights and responsibilities mm -hmm. and a connection to a community um, that is robust and, uh, and, and, and is a, a, a real sort of like living embodied community. And Stephen, what you were saying earlier about you know, your support for, for same-sex marriage based on the idea that you don't want people just out there dating. I want people to be islands unto themselves, right? So, yeah. so, so the socially conservative response to that is that it was the mainstreaming of disordered sexuality in the first place that led to the culture of you know single uh, you know sort of perpetual single life and uh, and you know uh, profligate sexuality and that the embrace of same sex marriage is sort of the logical conclusion of the mainstreaming mm -hmm. of disordered sexuality. Um, now it remains to be seen like a Burgerfell isn't going to be overturned, right? So I mean somewhere where Declan and I might disagree is just. The, you have to, politics is engaging with the world as it is, and we have to engage with the world as it is. Um, so I think that, that regardless of what you think of it, conservatives lost and we have to move on to a certain extent. But I don't think that means that we have to pretend that there won't be consequences. Every single policy has trade-offs. I think you can make an argument for same-sex marriage based on the fact that the trade-offs are worth it. But what I think is frustrating about, and increasingly a lot of conservatives, is the idea that there wasn't, there weren't any consequences, and there won't be consequences, and that to me clearly seems not true. And you view Pete Buttigieg and his husband kind of like sitting there getting photographed with babies in hospital beds as a consequence of that inaction, of that neutrality, that you're going to have people sort of cosplaying different roles of things that they're not. Am I understanding your viewpoint correctly? Right, and I mean, they they really did themselves no favors with that picture. Um, you know, in the sort of mockery of the image of a mother in, in the labor bed, um, they just reminded all of us that this is fundamentally unreal, what they're, what they're cosplaying here, as you say, um, that the natural reality of the family is not what these two men are are putting onto your Twitter feed. Um, and I, I don't know what the logic was behind the picture, why they got down in a hospital bed in which neither of them had given birth and decided to take a picture and put it out there for the world to see. Um, but they certainly did us a favor in, in illustrating the absurdity of the concept. I think one of the things that when I, when I kind of read that over and I, I look at your argument here, I still come back to you know, like the issue of adoption and family formation. You kind of talk about, like, we make choices about the way we've structured our adoption system, right? Like, there are tons of children out there who need families. One of the fallback kind of responses to that has always been, well, it's great that kids are finding families and being put with loving people, and you argue that they should still be going to heterosexual couples, prioritized and mandated by the government. First, do you think that gay couples should be allowed to adopt at all? No. Um... The, the family still exists as a natural thing. And even when we're talking about adopted families, um, it's still most healthy, uh, as we see, to mirror, um, well, that's not the word, to create these families on the natural model. Um, because biologically, we are created um, to be raised by a mother and a father. Um, and the absence of either the male or the female influence is detrimental to, to human development. Um, and then just in general, as, as a social is question... Is there solid evidence on that? There's certainly evidence, um, statistically. Um, the, the, uh, there have been studies um, that you know, depression is significantly higher among uh, children of same-sex parents, um, obesity, um, suicidal ideation. You're talking about the study rates. Invisible Victims, Delayed Onset Depression Among Adults with Same-Sex Parents. Right. That's one, one important study, yes. Right. That study was directly challenged by other people in the field. And, and this is to be expected, right? Like, people in the field of science are naturally going to support certain social causes. We consider them to be naturally to the left. I think that that's fair game. But that was directly challenged. I mean, the guy who did that study, himself, Catholic priest, like, he's actually in the church, right? So you have that to consider. And then you also have to consider the samples that they looked at. They were looking at children who were with same-sex couples starting at age 12 to 18, not kids who were raised in same-sex families at all. That matters a great deal, because you're talking about people who were in unstable families. Maybe they had a mom and a dad, and then they changed teams, right? And they start dating same-sex instead. That's unstable, and that's going to be challenging for any child. But that's not the same as raising a child with you the entirety of their life. Right. I mean, and a lot of it, there's 
the statistical and quantitative debate is entirely unsettled right now because this is something that we haven't been doing for very long. Um, it's, it's not a question that we have a firm answer to whether quantitatively it is absolutely worse for children to be raised by two parents of the same sex. Um, and frankly, I, I don't want to wait to find out. Um, I don't see why we would experiment with, with children's well-being. Um, but getting back to, to the secondary point, um, there's, we see the social costs in the breakdown of the family. When we normalize um, unnatural family uh, structures, um, we see, you know, as Nate has suggested a couple minutes ago, it's a slippery slope. The entire sexual revolution ethic is. Um, and when there's no actual compelling reason for the good of anybody involved besides, you know, personal happiness, turning a child into a means to personal fulfillment, I don't see any reason why we should normalize it as, as a social practice. And I mean, I think the, the question now, right, moving beyond the debate over issues that I think are essentially settled, and this, again, might be where I'm, I'm more moderate than Declan is, you know, the sexual revolution is upon us. It might have been a mistake, but it's here. And we have you know, multiple generations now that have been raised in an ethic that would have been unrecognizable to sort of most, most generations in Western civilization when it comes to sexuality. Um, so how are conservatives, and particularly social conservatives or conservatives who have a sort of socially uh, right, right-leaning bent on cultural issues, how are we to respond? Um, and that's where the conversation, I think, gets diverse and interesting. Um, because you, you, as much as it is um, not... Uh, it is not satisfying to say, and it will get you accused of sort of being a squish on, on Twitter. You have to accommodate things to a certain extent if you want to stop the worst things from happening. Um, and, and some, I think, conservatives, some social conservatives, and I consider myself a social conservative, so this is a critique of people on my own side, um, would prefer to kind of just stand back and, you know, uh, throw arrows at, at, at our culture. But we actually have to figure out how to engage with the sexual revolution because it has transformed our society. Um, there are socially conservative principles that we can use to engage with it. Um, but, you know, it, it, is, it is true that we are not going to go back to 1950. So how do we recover family life as best we can with the less than perfect circumstances? Well, I mean, the, the, the opinion that I've always had on like recovering family life is we allow people to form, and, and that's an opinion. It's defensible you know, it's, in that context. I, I think for me, like whenever I hear all this broken down, it is wanting people to live lives without meaning, to be nomads, to drift from person to person, and not be able to get anchored in a household, in a family. Um, you know, the idea that children are used by gay couples purely as commodities, like a car or a fancy handbag, I think that that seems to be a cheap version of. These people and everybody are always looking for meaning in their lives. No, I don't there's think that's nothing, true. No. There's nothing that gives you more meaning than the sacrifice of raising a child in a very selfish culture. I think that that's a noble thing to want to do. I, I agree. I agree with you, that. You, I mean, you, you refer you have, to it as a commodity. I mean, sure. There's a. I, I never said commodity. Um, well, it's, what's the right word? The, it's, a, it's a means to personal fulfillment, um, and that you should not view responsibility as a means to fulfillment. You don't carry out responsibilities because it makes you feel good. You carry out responsibilities because they are responsibilities. Um, and maybe in a vacuum, you could say that two men adopt, or no, not maybe, absolutely in a vacuum, you could say that two men taking in a child and caring for him um, when nobody else will is a, an absolute moral good, no question. Um, but these things don't happen in a vacuum. There are social costs to, to be balanced out, um, and we need to understand these things in context. Um, there, there are moral dimensions beyond just you know taking care of a child. Um, there's the, I. It's just unavoidable that the progress of the sexual revolution, which goes on through Obergefell and into gay adoption. Um, undermines the family. It does not strengthen it just because more people are saying that they belong to families. Mm -hmm. um, the, the question, though, and I think this is where the, the argument that Stephen's making is most powerful, right, is, okay, yes, that happened, right? So how do we, again, recover family life as best we can given the circumstances? And one argument is that it is better to have unconventional families than to have no families at all. 
I, I, there's arguments against that, but and, I'm saying and it. pair that with a rollback of no fault divorce. If I if I have one instinct, gay marriage, but no divorce. No, no, if I have like one strong instinct to go along with the guys at this table, it's I want no fault divorce to be a thing of the past, and for it to be an incredibly painful and costly thing yeah. for anybody to want to do once you have signed on to being part of a married family. I think it's been disastrous for society, and we pretty much just did it to enrich the American Bar Association. Uh, and, just because they lobbied effectively. And, and it wasn't actually particularly popular. There was no real mandate for it. It was something, it was sort of, uh, I mean, this is the, the sexual revolution in general has been an elite top-down revolution. It wasn't bottom-up. It was something that was imposed by college-educated elites on the rest of America. No-fault divorce is one of many examples of that, but that's basically the story of the sexual revolution. What do you think, Declan, and you wrote about this in one of your pieces t- titled We're All Transgender Now, about the idea of sort of that slippery slope and how we're now to the point where even when it comes to gender pronouns and how you identify, the neutral point of view is to start looking at people as devoid of their actual genders, he, him, male, and just having everybody start with the assumption of they, them. You had an interesting example of that when you went to college. Right. Um, it, it has become, or I wouldn't say it has become, but it's becoming the default now, certainly. Um, to, to go for supposedly gender-neutral pronouns, saying they, them, and then we wait for, for people to identify. Um, and I think we have to say that it's built in, uh, that there's no way to have gender be separate from biology for some people and connected to biology for others. Um, if we accept the basic premise of transgenderism, we have to accept it as universal. Um, there, there's just no having it both ways. Um, and there's really, I've never heard anybody present a compelling argument for what gender would be completely divorced from biological and physiological sex. Um, if it's not, you know, the enculturated and, and learned and passed down social expression of biological differences between two fundamentally distinct expressions of humanity, then what is it um, besides you know, a, a, a novelty of pronouns? I think there's also a difference between the older, what we used to call people with gender dysphoria, which is transsexual, and the new transgenderism, which is far more radical because transgenderism holds that gender, as we've traditionally understood it, or the gender binary doesn't exist at all. Transsexual is held that there was still a gender binary and they were moving between them, or they were people who felt like they were one. Right, but again, what I'm saying is that you can't, you can't have one without the other. If you, if you divorce gender from biological sex, if you say that it is something on its own, um, then that immediately becomes universalized. Um, and gender, because it does not actually exist outside of biological sex, when you try to make it stand on its own as a distinct concept, it falls apart. Right. And that leads us to where we are today. Right. And maybe it's a distinction without a difference, but I think there were – the older understanding of transsexuals was that they weren't actually transcending their biological sex. They were just people who felt like they weren't their biological sex and wanted to live. Yeah, gender uh, dysphoria had its moment, right. and then it immediately was thrown right out the, the door of psycho, psychoanalytic lingo. Yeah. But, I mean, it is, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that the new transgender activists are by far the most totalitarian of any left-wing activists, at least in recent memory, um, where they, you know, they're trying to get books banned from Amazon successfully, getting books banned from Amazon, right? You know, shutting down you know, people who, who sort of speak up or, and criticize the kind of things that they want to do to American society. Because, like Declan was saying, and I, I don't think this is true. To be fair, of the older kind of transsexuality, uh, the new transgenderism is only possible. It's only made possible if gender or biological sex doesn't exist at all, and therefore. The transgender activists understand, rightly, that they need to destroy notions of biological sex everywhere in order to fully be accommodated in our society. We're kind of up against time, so to try to take that and bring us towards the end here, how have we ended up at this point? And, and Declan, maybe you can give us your viewpoint. How has the, you know, eating from the twisted tree of liberty, right, like getting all of this wrong and our sense of what frees us, gotten us to this point where, like, nothing is real? Right? And I think this is a good example. It's the postmodernist idea. It's just like everything is subjective. And I, I take that point. I think that that's, that's somewhat true. Um, how can we get this right and course correct in a way that fits and comports with American government rather than some, some sort of pie-in-the-sky Catholic integralist ideal? 
Well, I not mean, to, I guess, not I guess to, to disparage your viewpoint. We, we don't the have question. the time to get into it, but I, I would not say that the two are necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, but how did we get here? It, it all ties back to the absolute maximization of individual freedom um, and freedom not properly understood. Freedom from is the only kind of freedom that the American uh, right seems to understand, or at least the institutional sort of consensus American right. Um, so we, we start with freedom from government. We insist on liberating ourselves from the tyrants in Washington um, on any matter, um, regardless of, of the morality of, of a given law that the people in Washington are, are trying to impose. Um, and then it moves down um, to, to freedom from your state government, to freedom from your town, to freedom from your homeowners association, to freedom from your family or any hypothetical family that might tie you down and minimize your options. And then inevitably it'll lead back up once you're this atomized individual to freedom from religion, from any obligations of conscience. Um, and once it starts, it doesn't stop. Uh, there is no saying that freedom is the absolute good, freedom is our highest political principle, but we're also going to maintain social order, we're going to preserve religion as a private matter, uh, and we're going to allow people to pursue visions of the good outside of the public square. It doesn't work, and this was Brent Bozell's point, um, that freedom, whatever it is, is not uh, ultimate or absolute. It is a, a means to an end, and until we restore that uh, order of priorities on the American right, there's no hope. Um, but once we do restore that, that order of priorities, um, there are fairly simple and incremental ways to move forward. Um, we just need to start talking about responsibilities again. Um, responsibilities, you know, moving sort of in the reverse direction. Um, responsibilities to the family, um, responsibilities to your local community, responsibilities to your state, uh, to the nation, um, and of course to, to your religion and to God and to an absolute moral order. Um, and once that order of priorities, responsibilities over rights and freedoms, um, what we owe to the world and to our fellow man uh, is restored on the American right. Um, that's, that's the end goal, um, or at least the, the starting point of restoration. I would just add one quick thing, which is I think it is, it is a maximization of the wrong kind of freedom, but it is also a constriction of the right kind of freedom. I mean, it is true that the massive growth of the administrative state, of a centralized bureaucracy in Washington, D.C., has done profound damage to the mediating institutions, you know, crowding out the, the, the institutions around which or middle sort of American society is organized in ways that have produced all the things that conservatives, and particularly cultural conservatives, care about. And I think, you know, that is... Um, you, that is somewhere where there is still a lot of place for libertarians and social conservatives or traditionalists, um, I think in areas at least to work together, which is the, the fact that, uh, you know, government bureaucracy in D.C. often is very bad and is uh, profoundly destructive to local communities. And local communities are obviously crucially important for all the things that, that Declan was talking about. So, uh, it, you know, there, there is a constriction of, of freedom, uh, but there's also... Um, there's, there's both a maximization of freedom and a constriction of freedom, and they both matter. We could go so much deeper. We've only scratched the surface, so I hope we can do this in another episode. Let's clean the slate here real quick. Some good news that's on everybody's mind. I know Declan's very excited about the world at all times. Nate, why don't you start us off? Anything good? Well, uh, this morning, I don't know that much about it, but Americans won the Nobel Prize. Uh, two American scientists, I think, won the Nobel Prize um, in physics, uh, which is, I think, significant and, and worth celebrating as, as patriotic Americans. Congratulations, America. Mm -hmm. We did it. We did. I'll, uh, I'll go next. So uh, I am always excited when Spotify actually feeds me something I do want to listen to, and today it finally got it right. This is probably before y'all's time, which is making me feel really old, but Bullet For My Valentine <laughs> has a new album out. Uh, it's called Rainbow Veins. 
and it's really, really stinking good. For a, a, a metal band from the early 2000s, it was kind of like at the intersection of metalcore and emo. Like They were really big back then, and they've been kind of awful for a long time, and now they're back, brutal, heavier than ever, uh, and it's kind of amazing. So I've been, uh, I've been rolling on that all day. Piece of good news. Declan? Um, it's uh, certainly not in my nature to, to see good news anywhere. Um, besides, of course, the, the gospel. <laughs> the gospel, um, yes. The good news. Uh, but we got a day without Facebook yesterday. Uh, I think there are signs that the uh, the unreal world is on its last legs, and let's pray for uh, an eternity without it. <laughs> we, could only, we could only be yeah. so lucky. Uh, that is it for this week's show of Right Now. I'm your host, Stephen Kent. Thank you for watching. We hope you will subscribe to the channel, like this video, leave a comment. I do try to respond to all of them. Uh, we will be back next week with more. Until then, keep asking why, stay out of line, and do be a bug in the system. We'll see you then.